And my prayer is that it will be well with your soul, that everything that happens in this place will be bringing you closer to God. There are so many people that I know who really dislike going to church, and they dislike going to church because they say it gives them such a guilty feeling. The whole point of the church is that it's to relieve the guilty feeling. The whole point of the church is not to make you feel worse when you leave, but right with God when you leave and closer to Him than you were when you came. It should fill you with grace and joy and peace. And if we're not doing that, then we're not really doing what we're supposed to be doing here. The world already knows it's in a mess. What the world is looking for is a solution. But the fact of the matter is, sometimes we really are in a mess. You know, have you ever had some things that just don't turn out the way that you thought they were going to turn out? Tonight I'm going to use some notes, and the reason is things haven't turned out the way that I thought they were going to turn out. And I'm reminded of the guy who was really, really uh, dependent upon keeping notes on everything. He didn't have a really good memory, and so he wrote everything down and kept it in a little book. He finished preaching one night and a very irate member of the church met him at the back of the auditorium and he said, I want to know something. And he said, well, what do you want to know? He said, I want to know if you've ever been to Chicago, Illinois. And he said, well, I don't know. And he pulled out his black book and he starts flipping through. He says, let's see, places I have been, Atlanta, Boston. Yes, I've been to Chicago, Illinois. And he said, I want to know if you met a girl there named Susie Smart. He said, well, I don't know. Let me see. Girls I have met. Girls I have met. Yes, yes, I, I, I met Susie Smart there. He said, did you kiss her? And he said, I don't know. People I have kissed. People I have kissed. Uh, yes, yes, I did kiss her. Well, she's my wife and I don't like it. Likes and dislikes. No, I didn't like it either. You know, it sounds, you can get a little, a little too much onto, your, onto yourself. But some days things just don't work out like you expected. I, I read the story some years ago, a true story apparently of a woman who walks into her living room. She lives out in the country and all of her kids are gathered around in a huddle in the middle of the living room and she thinks that's really cute. Walks over to see what it is and every one of those kids are looking at skunks, baby skunks that they have picked up from the yard and brought in the house. And without thinking, the mom said, children, run! And all of them grabbed a skunk and ran. It is not a good sight. It, I would just tell you, sometimes it doesn't go like you thought it would go. And sometimes that gets us discouraged, that life just hasn't turned out the way we thought it would. Sometimes life is too much. I, I will tell you that I hear from people all the time a, a statement that's just not true. They say, God will never give you more than you can handle. He will never allow you to have more than you can handle. Can I tell you something? That's not true. That God will let you get more than you can handle, and it happens all the time. Life is bigger than you are. The world is bigger than you are. The problems of the world are bigger than you are. And a lot of times, it's more than you can handle. What God has promised us is that he will not allow us to be tempted above what we were able, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. But yes, life is sometimes overwhelming. Uh, temptation, you can handle. But world, life, it was designed in such a way that we will be driven toward God. That's, read Romans chapter 8. That, that the world doesn't always work out the way you thought it would. And sometimes we look at that and we get a little bitter about it. I think I'm just going to leave this family. I think I'm just going to leave this job. I think I'm just going to leave this church. They haven't been treating me right. Things haven't been going well. And they're going to miss me when I'm gone. I think I'm just going to quit. I, I've seen people respond to life like that all of my life. You've known people who have decided to do just that all of your life. And maybe if you haven't quit or given up, do you ever have these kind of feelings? You know, there's just no use to this. It's not going to work out. Life is falling apart. The world is falling apart. As a side note, let me just tell you, when you say, I feel like the world's falling apart, the answer to that is, of course it is. The world has been falling apart ever since Adam and Eve sinned. It's been falling apart, and God's been putting it back together ever since. Yes, the world's falling apart, but uh, nothing, nothing really makes any difference. I'm just spinning my wheels and I'm not getting anywhere. I'm not gaining anything from the church when I go. I'm not being changed at all. I'm not really being challenged at all. Uh, I'm distressed by the things that are happening around me. The problems never seem to get any better. In fact, every time I think I'm through with one, I, I see another one. It's that 
It's that light at the end of the tunnel that turns out to be the train syndrome. I, things are so bad, and they're just not getting any better. I don't think I'll ever find happiness. I don't think I'll ever enjoy my job. It looks like that the grind is just going to wear me down to the ground. Life is mundane. It's, it's repetitive. It's Chinese water torture. That my successes never last and my failures accumulate. And life is not going the way that I thought it should. It's easy to feel that way, isn't it? I know that that's true, that people feel that way for two reasons. Number one, I talk to a lot of people. Number two, because there have been days I've felt like that. I don't know if you have, but there have been days where I thought, oh, this is never, ever going to work out. If, if you get, find yourself discouraged and life seems like it's just way too much for you to handle, I want you to know that you're in wonderful company. Just wonderful company. I, I want you to think about some people who have really gotten down. Moses was an amazing person, raised in Pharaoh's household. He was raised up by God to deliver his people. He has brought them through and across the Red Sea. He has led them by the power of God and through the amazing process of the ten plagues to this place of freedom and riches, really, that they've never had before. And so you think, what a powerful and great man. I want, you to, I want to read to you from Numbers chapter 11, verse 15. If you want to write these down and, and look at it a little later, this is what Moses said to God. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. This is Moses talking to God. He says, look how you're treating me. Just kill me now and get it over with. That's, that's Moses. He ever felt that way? Moses did. Moses knew what that felt like. How about this one? Joshua. He's the hand-picked leader after Moses. God has picked him himself. You know the kind of stuff that he does. Uh, you saw the wall of Jericho fall flat. You've seen all these wonderful things that he's done. And God has blessed him every step of the way. Listen to Joshua chapter 7, verse 7. Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content to dwell on the other side of the Jordan. And he's saying that after a great defeat. He feels like quitting. He said, why in the world did we come over here if we're going to have that? Why shouldn't we have stayed over there? If you've ever felt like, I really should never have tried this, Joshua knows exactly how you feel. Thankfully, he got over it. But he felt it. He felt it just like you feel it. How about Elijah? Of all the prophets of the Old Testament, Elijah's my favorite prophet. It's like he had lightning bolts coming out of the end of his fingers. When Elijah shows up on the scene and says, it's not going to rain until I say it's going to rain. That's the way he starts out. And then everything he does is astounding. I mean, the, the king sends out 50 guys to take him prisoner, and he says, if I'm a man of God, that's not going to happen. Whew, fire runs down from heaven and turns them into crispy Israelites. And, and the king says, wait a minute. He says, I'm going to send 50 more. These 50 guys show up. They step over the burnt corpses of the other people and said, you're coming with us. He said, not if I'm a man of God. Whew, fire comes down and kills 50 more. The king says to the last 50, get out there and get him. And if you're the last 50, you got to think about this. And so they said, please don't kill us. And we're not going to hurt you. If you'll just come with us, please, please, please. And he said, okay. But, but this is Elijah. I mean, everywhere he goes, things happen. The, the people are, are worshiping Baal, and, and he comes to the Mount Carmel. And you know what happens there. He says, okay, let's have a contest. If Jehovah's God, follow him. If Baal's God, follow him. And this is the way we're going to do it. You build your altar, and you call on Baal. And if he burns up the sacrifice on that, then everybody's going to worship Baal. But if they do, that doesn't happen, and God does it to my sacrifice here, then you better start serving God. And you know the story. The prophets of Baal cut themselves and cry out, and, and Elijah's over there making fun of him. He said, maybe he's asleep. Yell a little louder. Maybe he went on vacation. He said, maybe you can get him to come back. And, and they're doing it all day long. They try. And finally, when they give up exhausted, he says, we're going to do this a little different. Not only are we going to build this altar, we're going to dig a trench around it. We're going to soak it up with water to the point that the water is going to stand right there. And he says, okay, God, do your thing. Fire rains down from heaven. And this is what it says in the text. 
It didn't just consume the wood and the sacrifice. It consumed the stones themselves and all the water in the trench. It's just a burnt hole where it used to be. And they said, Jehovah's God. This is Elijah, okay? Now here's the amazing thing after that. Elijah then after that goes and prays that it will rain and it comes. The rain comes as he's prayed that it will come. And then he finds out that Jezebel, the queen, said, the Lord do so to me and more also if he is not like one of my prophets. He's killed 450 of her prophets. And she said, I'll kill him by this time tomorrow. He will be dead before this time tomorrow. And the man who stood up to the whole nation of Israel runs for his life. He goes out under a juniper tree, and, he, and he, this is what he says. Listen to this. He says it twice in 1 Kings chapter 19. Listen to verse 4. He prayed that he might die and said, It is enough now, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. In other words, nothing that I've done has worked. Nobody's listening to you. I thought the whole nation had just turned around, and it's, my whole life's work is worth nothing. Just kill me now. This is Elijah. If you ever have felt depressed, you know that you have company. Elijah has felt that himself. What about Job, the greatest of the men of the East? In one day, he loses everything, his children, his possessions. And in a few days later, he loses his very health, boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. And he's sitting in a, in a chimney corner with a pot shirt, scraping the pus. He's miserable. The only thing left to him is his wife, and she says, curse God and die. So really not much help. Uh, that's where he is. His friends come, and they're supposed to be a comfort. For seven days, they don't say anything. Smartest thing they ever did when they open their mouth, they're terrible. They're not helping him at all. So Job responds like this. And this he does it several times, but here's one in Job chapter 3, verse 3. May the day perish on which I was born, and the night in which it was said a male child is conceived. He said, I wish I had never been born. I wish I had never been born. Job, do you get it that you're not by yourself? How about this one? Here's, here's the greatest evangelist in the Old Testament. His name's Jonah. He goes to a city that's worshiping false gods and extremely wicked. And he has this message from God after he finally gets spit up by the big fish. He has this message from God, and I guess I would have listened to him. He'd have looked awful, and I'm sure he smelled like whale vomit. But he's walking through the town, and he says, Yet 40 days and Nineveh is destroyed. That's his message. And the people from the king all the way to the lowest animal put on sackcloth and ashes and repent. Everybody repents in the city. Now listen to how he reacts to this most successful evangelistic campaign. Jonah chapter 4, verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better to, live, better to die than to live. That's Job. He says, it's better for me to die than to live. He, and the reason is he didn't want them to repent. He wanted God to rain down fire and get rid of them. That's what he wants. But God is gracious, and he hasn't done it. He says, all of my life is not worth it. Just, just take me away. And that brings me to a text that I want us to look. Turn over to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. When you get to Acts chapter 18, beginning at verse 1, going down though through verse 11, and I'm not going to quote all of that tonight, and I'd like for you to read it at some point. Paul has left Athens, and he's come down to Corinth. And it's a particularly low time in his life. He's depressed. He's feeling like a failure. He spoke in Athens and was called a seed picker. You know what that is? They called him a babbler, literally a seed picker, a gutter snipe, a, a person who, a, a little bird that goes around through the gutters and picks up the trash and eats trash. They're saying he got a piece of this and a little piece of that, and he's not even worth listening to. He had very little success in Athens at all. And, and here's what he says about his time, by the way, if, if you go all the way over, keep your hand in, in Acts chapter 8 to me. I just want to tell you, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, when he talks about how he got there, he said, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. That's where Paul was when he shows up at, at Corinth. He's at a particularly low time. He says, I was nervous. I was shaky. I wasn't strong when I got there. There's some reasons for that. For one thing, he's really tired. Do you know how long it is to walk from Athens to Corinth? It's a 53-mile walk. 
He just walked 53 miles to get there, and he's really tired. Secondly, he's alone. Everybody that's an assistant to him is somewhere else trying to help build up churches, and he's by himself. In the third place, he's really torn because he's bivocational. He's not only a preacher and a missionary, he's also a tent maker and supporting himself. He's got to do both those things in order to be able to support himself. In the next place, he's stressed in spirit. Look at verse 5 of chapter 18. He says he was pressed in spirit. He's under spiritual stress. And then I think he had a sense of failure. And that's because he was called a seed picker and he didn't feel like there was very much success at all. And here's the next thing. He's frustrated because he has left probably the most idolatrous city on the planet. And now he's in the most wicked city on the planet. If you call somebody in the ancient world a Corinthian and they weren't from Corinth, it was an insult. To be a Corinthian meant that you had no morals because the Corinthians didn't. There was a temple to Aphrodite there on the, on the hill on Acrocorinth. Uh, that had a thousand temple prostitutes who every day prostituted in the name of their God. And your religious experience was to give them money and to have illicit uh, relationships with them. And that was the city that he's going into. And he felt unappreciated as well. Later on, he's going to write to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15. And he says, I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. I'd be willing to die for you, and you don't even love me. And it's just on this one mission trip. I want you to think about what he's been through already. He was beaten and jailed at Philippi. He was persecuted at Thessalonica and Berea. He was ridiculed in Athens. And now he has to face Corinth. It's a crossroads for his ministry. But God shows up. In these last few verses that we were looking at, in verses 10 through 12 particularly, God, or 10 through 11, and God shows up and says, trying times are not times to quit trying. Paul has to learn that you can't quit. And so Paul, he's encouraged by God, and and he gets the message, and he really does it. So you read in Acts chapter 18, verse 11, and he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God to them. Why was he able to do that? Because of, well, look at verses 9 and 10 for a moment. There are three promises that God gave to Paul that are good for us when it seems like life just isn't working out, that I'm not able to get things going the way they need to go. The first of those is the promise of God's presence. Look at verse 10. God says, I am with you. I love that. God tells him, listen, I am with you. Do you remember back over in Exodus chapter 3 when God appears in the burning bush and he talks to Moses? And Moses says, who am I that I should deliver your people? Do you remember the answer that God gives? He said, you're the one I'm with. I am with you. That's what he tells him. You don't need to know who you are. You need to know who I am and you need to know that I'm with you. Because I don't need your talent, and I don't need your intelligence, and I don't need your resources, and I don't need your resilience. I need you, and I can do whatever I want to if you'll let me work with you. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for that. He says, I am with you. This is the God who said and was quoted in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, is saying, I will never leave you nor in any wise forsake you. And if you have the Greek then you know that what that is, is that there are three times that he uses the word no and never together. It doesn't translate really well into English. But the closest English equivalent that I can find in that is that I will never, no, never, no, never forsake you. That's what God's saying. And he says it three times. Uh, There was a lady in the hospital and she was not doing really well. And the preacher said, you know, God will never forsake you. And he said it. I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake you. She said, maybe you Greek scholars need him to say it three times, but I get it when he says it once. I know he's never going to forsake me. And that's really absolutely true. Uh, Well, you know, when you look at the book of Matthew, it has these wonderful bookends on it. Remember chapter 1? You look at verse 23. You will, when he's told that you'll have a son, and his name will be called Emmanuel which being interpreted means God with us. 
And then you go to the end in Matthew chapter 22, and you get to that end verse of Matthew chapter 22, the end verse of Matthew itself. And he says, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. It starts out with God with us, ends with I am with you always. I have the promise from God of his presence in times of loneliness. I'm not there by myself. When I'm in the valley, I'm not there by myself. You know, uh, when defeat comes, discouragement comes, sickness comes, financial reversals, heartaches come, family problems come. I have to remember that the God of the mountain is also the God of the valley. He's there in both places. Whether I'm up or whether I'm down, he's there all the time. A number of years ago, long ago now, a little boy came home and told his mama, he said, uh, we had one of my friends in school today that showed up. We've been missing him for about a week, and he came back today, and the teacher talked to him and asked him how he was doing, and he said he just started crying and said his daddy died, and that was the reason that he was away. And she said, well, what did you do? He said, I couldn't think of anything to do, Mama, except just put my head on my desk and cry with him. I want to tell you there's something in that. <clears throat> when I first started preaching, I, the very first funeral that I ever was asked to conduct was for a six-year-old boy who had died of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, the only child of a young parent, of a young set of parents. And they asked me to do that funeral, and because I was a recent graduate of Freed Hardeman and felt the need to defend God, I did all of the arguments I could on why you can still believe in God. I had this all in my head. I studied all night before I went to see them of why you can still believe in God, even though terrible things have happened to you. And I was ready to defend God to the hilt. I, I was going to be on God's side when I walked in and talked to this young family. And when I walked in, they sat down on the couch and held each other and cried and cried and cried. And I looked at them, and I realized that if I tell them what I have been planning to tell them all night... If I were them, I would throw me out on my ear. They are hurting, and they don't need me to defend God. God's big enough that he can take care of himself. They need me to care about them. And so I sat down on the couch with them, and we talked about their son. I let them talk about how much they loved him and all the good things about him. And they cried some more, and I cried with them. And I walked away that day from their house thinking that I should go sell insurance because I surely wasn't much of a preacher. I, I didn't give them a whole lot of scripture. I didn't defend God at all. And, and I felt like a total failure. I went ahead and preached that funeral, but I really thought maybe I need to change my heart because I'm not very good at this. When the funeral was over and we had the burial service, the couple came to me and said, you have no idea how much it meant that you came and sat with us and cried and cared for us. And I thought, oh, I wasn't supposed to defend God. I wasn't supposed to say anything like that. I was just supposed to be with them. That's all I was supposed to be, is with them. Now, the reason that that's important to me in a lot of ways is because we have someone, whenever we're in our valley, that's just like that. We do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but one who was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. Jesus could have come to the earth and said, look, here's the thing. All of you have sinned, and all of you deserve to die, and you really should bow down at my feet, and none of you were doing it. He had every right to say, and you deserve to be lost. And he would have been exactly right. He, we deserve to be lost. But instead of showing up at the funeral to tell me that the reason that there was a death here is because we sinned, he sat down and cried with us at the funeral. Remember? Jesus wept. He cried at the funeral, not because Lazarus was not going to rise from the dead, but because the people he loved were hurting. And he cried with them when they were hurting. We do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He feels what we feel. He knows that. He loves us. When you're going through difficult times, when you're in the valley, 
when you're facing death, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Great Psalm, Psalm 23. You know, he's with us. Even when you're facing death, he's with you. I had this surgery back in May, at the end of May. I had a small heart attack, and I was going to have this surgery. And I have this strange reaction generally to any kind of, of anesthetic. When they put me out, I tend to react wrongly somehow to that. I, I tend not to wake up, and they always have a very difficult time getting me to wake up. That uh, My blood pressure drops really far, and they don't always have a lot of confidence that they're going to get me back. And so I thought about it as I was getting ready to have this surgery. I, I thought, you know, I might, not, I might not wake up. This could be my last day on earth. It actually could be my last day on earth. And then I asked myself, have I been good enough to go to heaven? And immediately I thought, well, that's a dumb question. Of course not. I have never been good enough to go to heaven. I never will be good enough to go to heaven. I'll never have done enough to earn God's love or his favor. I'm just never going to be able to do that. I know that better than anything. But here's what I also know. That God is faithful. And I know that I trust him. And I know, live or die, everything is fine. And I had absolutely complete peace when they brought me back to that room, complete peace. If he takes me away, I'm going to regret that I'm not going to have Beverly. But if I get to stay, I get her. And it's great. Whichever way it is, it's great. I'm okay. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You're with me. I have the promise of God's protection. Look at verse 10 of Acts chapter 18. I'm going to read this. I believe it's from the ESV, but it possibly is the New King James. But I love what he says. He says, no one shall attack you to harm you. He tells, he tells Paul, he says, look, I know that you're worried. And, and he says, but there's nobody that's going to attack you to harm you. This is really an interesting statement to me because God makes that promise to us as well. But it might be interesting that he doesn't say nobody will attack you. You're going to get attacked in life. Everybody's going to get attacked in life one way or the other. And he doesn't say, literally in the Greek, he doesn't say no one will attack you and hurt you. Because sometimes people do hurt you. People can hurt you. That can happen to you. He says no one will attack you to harm you. Here's what he means. Whether you live or whether you die, if they attack you and they kill you, they haven't harmed you. There's nothing essential that they have done to you when that occurs. Some of you have seen the, the statement about cancer, that cancer can do so little. That cancer can only kill your body. It can only rob you of your physical strength. It can't take away your dreams. It can't take away your hope. It can't take away your heart. It can't take away your love. It can't take away anything that is essential to who you are. Cancer is so weak that it cannot take away what is good and noble and wonderful about life can't do it. I have a promise. Cancer can't hurt me. Beverly's brother was standing in a pulpit like this in Knoxville, Tennessee, preaching on a Sunday morning. And all of a sudden, he realized that he couldn't read the words on his notes. He couldn't remember what that word meant. And he was having this terrible headache, and he couldn't figure out what that was at all. And he said, I don't know what's going on with me, but somebody needs to come and, and take this sermon and finish this for me because I can't read this anymore. And he walked out the back of the auditorium, and they took him immediately to the emergency room. They ran tests on him the next day, and he had a glioblastoma multiforme, which is the worst form of brain cancer you can get. There's no cure for it. It's 100% fatal. If you get treatment, you may last for 24 months, sometimes a little bit longer. Without treatment, you may last for 20 months or so. And, uh, but it's going to kill you. There's, it just eats away your brain and it's going to kill you. We prayed and prayed and prayed 
And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people prayed all over the world. Russell had done mission work in India and other parts of the world. And people all over the world were sending messages. We are praying for you. We all prayed that Russell will be cured. Russell is cured. He died six years ago. And he is totally cured. He is not suffering with cancer. He's not suffering with pain. He is not harmed. In the end, death only opened the door to go home. What an amazing thing that is. When you're facing death, realize nothing. Nothing is going to harm you. Paul is in a prison. He's not going to get out of it. Everything is going to end with him being beheaded. That's what's going to happen. What does he write about that in 2 Timothy chapter 4? He said, I am already being offered and the time of my departure is at hand. Now listen, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me in that day. Not to me only, but to all those who have loved his appearing. He said, this is going to hurt me. I'm going to die. But I have finished what I started to do. And God will keep his promise. Satan is laughing on Friday. He's laughing because he's finally, in his mind, defeated the Son of God. He's put him on a cross. He's seeing him writhing in agony. He sees him as the defeated person, and he's finally, Satan, finally on the throne, and Jesus out of his way. Jesus, rather than crying, rather than whimpering, says, it is finished. He said, I've done it. I've done it. And then he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Not long before he had said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He couldn't hear him. He couldn't feel him. He couldn't see him. Now he says, I can't hear you. I can't see you. I can't feel you. Catch me. I'm jumping. I'm jumping straight into your arms. I can't see you at all, but I have no doubt you'll catch me. Into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. In times of death, darkness, and difficulty, listen, you have God's presence, God's power. It's incredible. So Paul could write, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. God will take you when he's through with you. Can I tell you something about all of that? He's saying, look, you're going to do my work here. Nobody's going to put their hand on you to harm you. And this is a point that I take from this that I think is really important. God has a work for everybody in this room to do. There's something you're supposed to do with your life. And it's not just to be baptized. There's something after having been baptized you're supposed to do with your life. And for you, it's unique. None of you are having exactly the same thing that I have to do with my life. And while the general picture is we serve God, we grow in Christ, and we share Him with the other people of the world, there's something very specific that God had in store and in mind for you to do. Maybe you've already done it, but you're not through yet. Whatever it is that He wants you to do, He is going to allow you to do it. Whatever it is that he desires for you to do, when you desire to do it, God is going to allow you to do it. And whatever people might do to get in your way, no one will put a hand on you to harm you. He's going to allow you to do your work. So what we pray is what one of the great preachers at Creve Hall prayed years ago. Every single night, he would pray this prayer to God. God, if you have something for me to do tomorrow, wake me up. He prayed that every single night until one night when he was in very poor health. After he had prayed that prayer, he went to sleep and didn't wake up. I'll never forget, they said at his funeral, God didn't have anything else for him to do here. When he was done, he was done. He was able to go home. God is going to take us home. So ahead of us is our guide Behind us is our guard, underneath us are his everlasting arms, and above us is the God of glory, who doesn't miss a thing that's happening to us at all. 
If you're a child of God, you have that. Maybe one more thing, and then I, I promise I'm going to quit, okay? Look at the second half of verse 10. He said, I have many people in this city. If you were here yesterday, you know that I mentioned this at least in one point. There's only a handful of Christians that are in this town at all. God says, I have many people in this city. What does that mean? It means that potentially God has Christians all over this city. He's already working on them and he already knows who they are. And if Paul will just speak what God wants him to speak, that there will be people who will come. That was his intention. And, and, and so what I'm telling you is that what God sees is not what I tend to see. I look at the world and I say, look at these sinful people. Look at, look at how they don't care about the Lord. They don't care about their country. They don't seem to care about their kids. Kids don't care about their parents. Uh, the world is so messed up. Everything is slithering out of the closet while Christians are being pushed back in. You can promote anything but saying that something is right or wrong. You can't promote that at all or else you're a bigot. These are terrible times that we live in. And God says, hold on. Don't you see what I see here? What I see here is the potential in people. I do not see the sinners in Spencer. I don't see the sinners in central Wisconsin. I see the potential Christians in central Wisconsin. That's what I see. And when Paul heard from God, I have many people in this city, he suddenly changed the way he approached that city. Later on, he's going to write about them. And I want you to see the kind of people that he converted. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, or adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now listen. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He said, God didn't pick the good people in this town. He picked the sinners, and he made them into righteous people. That's what he's doing right here in Spencer. That's what he's doing in central Wisconsin. That's what he's doing in Nashville. That's what he's doing in Africa. That's what he's doing all over the world. If you're bothered by the world, if you hate what you're seeing on the internet, what you're seeing on television, if you hate what you're hearing at work, how about seeing the people at work, seeing the people who show up on television like God does? How about seeing them for who they could be? If we'll just speak his word. The gospel is the power of God to save. It was then and it is now. Somebody says, but the whole thing is, everybody today ridicules you. If, you. if you hold Christian values, they ridicule you as out of touch, or as Obama said, as people whom history has passed by. He said, if you believe certain things, history has passed you by. I don't care if history has passed me by. God has not passed me by. And he hasn't passed you by. And if you think that you're going to look foolish, then I would tell you you'll be in exactly the same situation Christians were in the first century. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 1? Seeing that the Jews require a sign and then that the Gentiles see this as foolishness? But we preach Christ crucified. What do you do when the world thinks you're foolish? You keep speaking in the name of Christ. And the world was changed in that first century because you could kill Christians you could ridicule Christians, but you could not stop them. You couldn't stop them for anything. God is with you. And when you look at the world around you, you see the potential in people. Bob probably remembers this. I don't know. When I was in Houston, Texas at the Memorial Congregation, one Sunday while I was preaching, I, 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 we always ask people, would you like to study the Bible with us? This was one of the things that was on our visitor's cards every week. And six Chinese doctoral students checked yes. And I thought that was interesting. They were Chinese nationals, and they had come because one of their professors was a member of the church. They had been sent by the Chinese government to come to America to learn how to clone people because all China needs is more people. I, I, I just thought that was interesting. But they had actually come to learn how to clone people, and they were all getting their doctorate degree some of them already had doctorate degrees. They were brilliant, brilliant young people. And they had been sent by the Chinese government to learn how to do this. And now they showed up at the memorial church and said, we'd like to study the Bible with somebody. I think they were just being nice. 
But, but we met with them. I met with them. And, and I talked to them about, uh, about all the arguments. I knew that they were atheists. As we talked, I knew that they were atheists. And I had, for years, hoped for the opportunity to use all of my Christian evidences classes that I'd taken. And, and I wanted to use those arguments. So I used the teleological argument, the ontological argument, the cosmological argument. I didn't use those names, but I, that's what I did. I, I talked about the argument from design. I talked about the argument from existence. I, I talked about the argument of cause and effect. I, I talked about all these arguments that would show the possibility of the existence of God. God. And when I got through with all that after about an hour, they looked at me like I had been speaking Swahili. It didn't make a bit of difference to them what I had said, and it hadn't changed their belief that the only thing you could believe in was the state and that there wasn't a God. And I said, look, I, I kind of blew this, uh, and I'm sorry. I, I, I blew this, but can we come back next week? Would you just give me one more chance to sit down with you and talk to you again next week? They said, sure. So they showed back up the next week. And, and during the week, I had prayed a lot. What am I going to say to these folks when they show up? And then I remembered John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, when he said, many other signs of Jesus that are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. And I suddenly realized it's not that I need to use philosophical arguments with these people. I want them to read the Bible. I want them to read the Bible with me. There's something about the Bible that will help people believe. And so I started with them with the story of the prodigal son. And I just had them read it. And I, I, if you've never read the story of the prodigal son and you're from an entirely different culture, the story is astounding to you. They were amazed by the story of the prodigal son. And they had all kinds of questions. Like, why would the father bring them back? I know what we would do. He would be shamed forever. He wouldn't be allowed to come back. Why would he do that? It gave us a chance to talk about the nature of God. I said, this is the kind of God that the Bible teaches. This is the kind of God that I believe in. And I didn't ever, one more time, ever try to convince them that God existed. I just showed them from the Bible who God is. And, and, and the next week, they came back. They said, do you have any more stories like this? I said, the Bible's full of them. So the next week we took another parable, and it was the parable of the wicked servant and the king who, uh, who had forgiven him and then had to put him back in because he was unforgiving. And they said, but what was wrong with that king? He should have done it in the first place, and why in the world would he even give him a chance? The man had spent so much, and we can't believe it. It's not what I would do. And I said, but this is the kind of God that we have. He's forgiving regardless of how large the dead is, and he wants us to be forgiving people too. I said, can we come back next week? I said, sure. We studied another story, and then another story, and then another story from the Bible. And I'll never forget that, oh, several weeks in, after we had been studying with them, I got an email from them, and they said, we're not going to be able to be here this coming Sunday. And I thought, oh, no, I've lost them. They said, we're having to move a friend from Houston to another town, and the only day we have to do that is Sunday, and so we're going to do that. But then at the end, it had a little note, and it said, we want you to know we have fallen in love with the God you're telling us about. And I thought, wow. We kept looking and reading the scriptures together. And after, oh, a good long while, they want, came to me and they said, we believe that there is a God. And we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we believe that he wants us to be baptized. But we have a question for you. As you know, we're here because the Chinese government has sent us here. If we become Christians, it's very possible for our family members who are still in China to be imprisoned because we've become Christians. We will become traitors to our own country. And it's also possible that we could be recalled to China and put in prison and even possibly killed just because we believe in Jesus. And they said, our question to you is, is it worth it? I had never had anybody in my life ever ask that question when they really faced the definite possibility of dying for it. And so I really stopped and it made me pray before I answered it. And I... I in the end, after we prayed about it for a moment, I said, I can't answer that question for you. That only you can answer that question for you. I, I will tell you, for me, if it cost me my life, yes. 
It's worth it. But you have to decide. What do you want to do? They said, we want to go and pray about it for a little while. Two hours later, they came back and we baptized all six of them. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing that we had. God took atheists who were dedicated to a communist state, determined to promote a communist philosophy, and changed them into Christians. He changed them into people who would make a difference. Some of them went back to China. We have sent Chinese missionaries to China at communist government expense, and I love that. I'm just telling you, God didn't see atheists. He saw people who would be Christians. God doesn't see that this world is such a black place. He sees what this world could become. And he wants us to see it too. Nothing you do in the name of Jesus is wasted. Whether it's a cup of water, whether it's a smile to someone, whether it's giving someone hope that doesn't have it, nothing you do is wasted in this world. I had the opportunity to be at Dan's workshop today. Dan is an artist with wood, and I love what he does. I will just tell you that. Do you know, I believe that with every piece of furniture that he makes, that God is pleased with that piece of furniture. Do you know that I believe that for everything he does to the best of his ability, that it glorifies God? Whatever that is, that it glorifies God. That whether you're working in a cornfield, whether you're working in a factory, whether you're working somewhere else, whether you're struggling with small children that are just driving you nuts, whatever it is that you are doing in your life, when you do it in the name of Christ, when you do it because God is changing the world through you, the children and everyone else that you meet suddenly takes on an entirely different perspective. This is not mundane. It's not secular. It's glorious. What you're doing, when you do it well in the name of Christ, is glorious because God is working to change our world. He's a light shining in a dark place and you're reflecting Him. Wherever you are, whatever it is that you do, you're reflecting Him. And nothing is hopeless. And nothing is helpless. And everything, everything, is full of potential. Don't ever forget it and don't ever give it up. But that promise, I will tell you, is made to God's people. If you're not yet baptized for the remission of sins, you need to become one of God's people. There's nothing more hopeless in life than to know that this life is not going to work out the way you thought it would and the next one's going to be worse. But there's nothing greater than to know that everything you do here matters, that everything you do here counts for good, and the next world is going to be more wonderful than you can imagine. If you haven't been baptized for the remission of sins, I hope you will be. And if you've been down and discouraged and sometimes ready to give up, don't beat yourself up about it. Just start looking at life like God looks at it. And begin to look at people like God looks at them. And begin to know, oh, I'm not by myself. Ever. Ever. Everything is full of hope. Everything is full of glory. Everything is noble when I approach it in a noble service to God. Would you, tonight, if you need prayer, come. If you need to be baptized, come. And why don't you do it now while we stand and sing?